Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello and welcome back to the Garden Gurus live show. I'm Darren Seno. They let me back in the office. It's great to see you all. I'm stepping into the, the hosting seat for Trevor for the next couple of weeks while he's away in Egypt. Half his luck. We're back with another great episode of the Garden Gurus this weekend and I'm thrilled to be talking plants and gardens with you all. We'll also be giving away prizes during this season of the live show. So pop your gardening questions into the comment section below to go in, the chance, go in for a chance to win a $50 voucher from Garden Express. And make sure to include your location because that really helps when, coming, when it comes to answering your questions. Now, as you all know, we're broadcasting from Perth and we've been enjoying some absolutely brilliant gardening weather, except for the fact that we're getting no rain. And so I've been spending a lot, time, a lot of time in my garden be really interested to hear how the weather's standing up for everybody all around Australia because we're broadcasting right across the country and even around the world. So, for your garden, a too much rain. We're really interested to know. The Garden, Ex oh, where are we? The garden Express um, have a, can't see it. Garden Express have three collections on offer for the great price of $15.50 of a great variety of lavender. It's called La Diva, very beautiful. So it's been bred to be so much more compact than all the other varieties of lavenders. Flowers for an extremely long time, really hardy and a great garden plant. La Diva Big Night and La Diva Sampler Packs, you can get fits in 100 mil pots and save 25% off the recommended retail price. What a great deal. Now you need to get in quick, because you don't want to miss out. And here's Trevor to tell you more about this gorgeous plant. As we celebrate the Garden Gurus Australian Horticultural Trials Week, new plant releases, we will give you the chance to get in early and celebrate by getting your hands on your own superior genetics. The La Diva collection of lavender from Doom and Orange are simply spectacular. A combination of breeding between the French, the English and the Spanish varieties has delivered a more compact plant with longer flower heads and just spectacular flowers. Best of all, the disease resistance is exceptional. Now I've got some really good news for you. You can get your hands on them thanks to our friends at Garden Express. They have three collections on offer for a great price of $15.50 each. Featuring La Diva Imperial, La Diva Big Night, or a La Diva Sampler Pack, saving you 25%. If you want to get your hands on these beautiful lavender, I've got some good news for you. You can, thanks to our friends at Garden Express, you can go shop 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the comfort of your armchair and you will end up with these beautiful plants delivered direct to your door. Now don't miss out because they won't last long. Beautiful. They're fantastic looking lavenders and that's a great price from Garden Express. If you're in the market for some beautiful, hardy Mediterranean plants, you can't go past that deal. Now, Lynn Rust has messaged into us. She has a frangipani, penny, wants to plant it up into a bigger pot and wants to know when's the best time to do it. Well, Lynn, with frangipani, pennies, depends a little bit on the variety. Unless it's one of the really tropical types, you can do them right now. Get them in, into the bigger pot, fresh potting mix. Um, while there's still a little bit of warm weather left around, their root system will grow and will be ready for spring. If it's a more tropical type or, or if you're at local areas already into the cooler weather, I'd probably hold to middle, even late spring and do it then. Frangipanis love the warm weather. They don't like their root system being cold and damp. So put it somewhere where it's not going to get too wet and that can drain really freely. But you know, play it, if you want to play it safe, leave it till mid to late spring. Also got a message from Pete Mundy in South Australia. Now he was asking about zeolite. He's been trying to find some zeolite to use in his garden 
and hasn't been successful so far. Well, Pete, you should be able to get zeolite pretty much at any place that sells gardening type products, so your local gardens and your local hardware. Zeolite is generally regularly stocked, but also places that specialise in fish and pond life, so pond plants and uh, aquatic plants and your local fish supply. They should carry zeolite as well because it's used in that industry as well. Have a, uh, an ask around of those type of places and you really should be able to find it. And it's generally available in small bags, medium sized bags and big bags. So depending on how much you need, you should have no trouble picking that up. Now, David from Delkeith, so uh, in my part of the world has problems with the trees on this verge, not looking healthy, possibly dying. Uh, wants to know if there's something he can do about it and is it a council issue? Well, David, your council tree does technically belong to the council. The rules around them vary from council to council and obviously from state to state. So that'd be the first port of call for me. Check with your local council. Most of them have very good websites with plenty of information on. Find out exactly who is liable for looking after your council tree. Now in Perth, we've had a very, very long time without rain, without any significant rain. And the birch trees are really starting to show the, the signs of this uh, prolonged rain drought. And you can pretty much drive around Perth at the moment and work out which verges are irrigated by the state of their, their verge trees. So if your tree is looking in very poor condition, go out to it, have a scratch around, see what the soil is looking like under it. My chances are in Perth at the moment, it's going to be very, very dry. So some seaweed solution, something like sea sol, a good quality wetting agent, really soak that into the ground and give the tree a really good water. You might need to do this once a week until we get into some regular rain and hopefully your tree will recover, but it's always worthwhile flicking a message to the council. Say you're worried about the verge tree, they'll send one of their horticulturals out to have a look at it and they might put it on a list where it gets a bit of extra hand watering. They send the water truck out, give it a bit of water and hopefully your verge tree will soon be looking fantastic again because they are a very important part of our urban canopy cover. So it's great to hear you're concerned about your verge tree and you're looking to look after it. Maria in South Melbourne wants to know what's the best deciduous tree to plant in her small garden and what's the best way to get rid of the leaves once they've fallen. She wants to know, can she use it for mulch? Well, Maria, you can use the fallen leaves for mulch or you can put it into the compost system and compost it. It's a great addition to compost. The good thing about deciduous leaves and compost is they're already partially broken down before they drop off the tree. So you put them into the compost pile or into the compost tumbler and they break down very, very quickly and they also help to fuel the breakdown of the other products in your compost bin. So my preference is if you can to compost them, but you can just leave them in the garden and they create a beautiful leaf mold, which supports things like earthworms and soil microbes. As far as the best tree for a small, best deciduous tree, for a small garden, I think you cannot go past crepe myrtles. They are gorgeous trees, so much to offer the gardener. Beautiful summer flowers, which are probably their highlight, but also they have great autumn foliage. So you'll get shades of yellows and oranges and reds in the foliage. So that's a great showpiece as well as the flowers. And even when they're bare, so the drop of their leaves in late autumn, you've got bare stems, the, the uh, trunk and the, the bark itself is really ornamental. Shades of creams and grey, a little bit like a leopard tree, for people familiar with the leopard tree. So it still looks great even in the middle of winter. So summer flowers, beautiful fresh growth in spring, autumn colour, and then a really interesting architectural bark. I think the crepe myrtles would be the, my first stop for it. any small garden looking for a deciduous tree. Leone in Adelaide said she planted some hellebores last year, and hellebores are a beautiful plant, great for, for tough, shady positions where you can um, find other things that are difficult to grow. Now she's had some issues with some of those hellebores dying off. And the problem is sometimes with the hellebores, if the ground is too wet over winter, so it's not getting sufficient drainage. Um, if the, the water, soil is not draining well over winter, the hellebores are sitting in very damp soil, you can get root rot. So that'll be the first thing that I would have a look at. They have plant. It's time for plant of the week, my favourite time. So plant of the week, I've bought in today, gained something from my garden at home. We put this up on the Facebook live feed before the start of the show to see which of our um, viewers and uh, listeners could identify it. And we had a pretty good success rate with the correct identification. This is a, an ornamental ginger, the blue ginger, Dicorisandra is its botanic name. I think 
an important fact about this plant we need to mention before we say anything else. It's not an edible ginger. Do not eat the blue ginger. It will only cause you problems. This is actually more closely related to plants like the, the trade scantias, the wandering dew, those sort of ornamental plants, which are, again, not suitable for eating. So the blue ginger is just a common name. Certainly doesn't suggest you should be putting it into your curries. Now, the blue ginger is a warm climate plant. So if you're growing it in a cooler part of Australia, you need to find somewhere where over winter, it's going to be able to stay that little bit warmer and um, have nice free draining potting mix or soil around the root system so it doesn't rot. In summer, once the weather heats up, they throw up these beautiful canes of dark green foliage. And then in early autumn, they start to set the flowers. And the flowers are the reason you grow the blue ginger. Blue is a really um, unusual colour to see in the garden and gardeners really do look for it in their, the plants that they grow. So the blue ginger has this beautiful dark blue, almost purple flower that comes at the end of the canes. Once the plants mature, you may get 30, 40, 50 flowering spikes in one season. Stunning plant, flowers over a long period of time. For a lot of gardeners, the best way to grow the blue ginger will be in pots. They're easier to manage the soil and then you can move them into a warmer, um, less damp area in winter. So I grow all mine at home in pots and I, they succeed brilliantly. That said, I have seen a lot of them in gardens do particularly well. The warmer your climate, the better they'll grow in the gardens. The cooler it is, the more likely I would say to grow them in pots. So keep an eye out for them in your local garden centre at the moment. They're in flower at the, um, right now and they tend to only be in the garden centres when they're in flower. So look out for the blue gingers. They're not a cheap plant, but they're a great value for plant. Uh, we've been getting some really fantastic questions from you all. Keep those gardening questions coming in. Sending in photos really helps. So if you can give us a photo of the plant and a little bit of context around it, what area it's growing in, is it getting a lot of sun, a lot of shade, what the soil's like, that will really help us give you um, uh, tailored advice to whatever your problem is. And here's a quick tutorial on how to send us in your photos. If you've got a gardening question you'd like us to answer and you need to send us a photo, we'll simply head to our Facebook page and click on message. Type out your question and click the camera icon to take a photo in the app. Or click the image option and select the image you want to send us. Be sure to allow Facebook access to your camera and camera roll. We check our messages regularly, so sit back and be sure to tune in to the Garden Gurus Facebook Live show every Friday and you'll hear your answer. So sending in uh, pictures of your plants is not very hard. So if you've got a blue ginger in your garden that's flowering at the moment, how about send us in a picture and let us know just how well this plant is going in your garden and how much you love it. We'd be really interested to know. If you've got a blue ginger and it's growing and flowering, now it's a great time to apply a bit of fertilizer. They like to be fertilized in the warm time of the year. And then once it cools down, the plants can go a little bit ratty, but just ignore them, leave them through winter, once we get into spring, then maybe repot, fertilise, and it'll go away and flower and uh, grow magnificently in response to some nice, beautiful, warm weather. So we're on to back to the questions now. Um, we've got Leah in Brisbane. The leaves on her dwarf mulberry tree are turning yellow and have some brown parts on them. Is that normal for this time of year? Well, Leah, yes, it is. Thankfully, it means you don't have a problem with your dwarf mulberry. Mulberries are a deciduous tree. As soon as the nights start to get a little cooler, they respond to that by removing all the sugars and um, nutrients out of the leaves of the plants, putting it, storing it away in their root system, and the leaves fall off. And as we spoke about with the crape myrtle, the mulberry leaves are a great mulch or a, a leaf mold that can be left around the base of the plant or go into your compost heap. When that mulberry is completely dormant in winter, if you need to, but need to, to keep it in shape and just tidy it up, a light prune is a great way to go. Love the dwarf mulberries. The red chatou is my personal favourite. So Jeanette Miller in Pingley in WA has a beautiful grapefruit and orange tree, which no matter what she does, they seem to look sad, which is not what we like to hear. Has a big ficus tree growing next door and wonders whether that ficus is stealing all the moisture and nutrients from her citrus tree. Well, Jeanette, probably. That's what ficus do, unfortunately. Their root system will travel literally kilometres looking for nutrients 
looking for water. So if you have a really large tree growing next door, probably not a lot you can do about it. Um, it root barriers don't really work on ficus. They're uh, just, their root system is so vigorous, they'll get around most root barriers. What you'll need to do with your two citrus trees is apply more fertilizer in small amounts more regularly. So probably once a week, once a fortnight during the warm weather, apply liquid fertilizers and supplement that with a slow release, controlled release fertilizer like Troforte. Troforte make an excellent citrus specialist fertilizer, which will work particularly well in your situation. Try and give those uh, poor citrus trees every chance to compete against the more vigorous root system of the ficus. It's a bit of a tough one because although that ficus is stealing some nutrients and moisture from your citrus tree, it's probably providing beautiful shade and some habitat for your local birds and insects. Now, Haley wants to know, what do, do you prefer to have in your gardens from an aesthetic perspective, mulch or river rocks? Um, from an aesthetic perspective, I, with the mulch, I prefer a mulch that's going to look after my soil. So I prefer an organic mulch, a hardwood mulch. Uh, I still think the hardwood, hardwood mulches looks great in the garden. And the idea with most of our gardens, we want to have them so full of plants that you don't really see the mulch. The mulch is not there for its visual value. It's there for its ability to protect our soil, protect your soil life, feed the soil in many cases as well. So I generally go for the organic mulches. Um, river stones and gravels can look great, uh, particularly when used with things like uh, in conjunction with succulents. I think um, that stone mulch and succulents is a great combination. But just keep in mind, stone mulches can be difficult to maintain if you're getting a lot of leaf drop into them. Um, the leaves can stick and decay and just look unappealing with, sitting on top of the stone mulches. But um, they still do the same job as far as cooling the soil and protecting the soil from the direct sun. So it's a little bit of personal taste. I like the organic mulches mainly because they, they're better for the soil in the long run. But it comes down to what you're doing in your garden. Now, Tim in Brisbane has a dwarf only that dwarf orange that has only ever grown one orange. Is there a reason why? Well, there could be several reasons there, Tim, and one orange on your tree is definitely underperforming. You should be getting a lot more than that. First thing, uh, port a call for me, have a look at the soil. Is it in a pot? Is it in the ground? Uh, if it's in a pot, you may need to repot it up into a bigger pot, provide some good quality premium potting mix to really um, feed that root system, make the tree more robust and more able to have more oranges on the tree and without overtaxing the tree itself. So the, the support the, root, the soil gives to the root system and then the root system gives support to the tree. If it's growing in the ground, just have a look at how healthy your soil is. Is it quite sandy? Is it very heavy in clay? Um, you may need to add a, some compost to the soil to feed that soil up, get the soil in good condition and the tree will take care of itself. Um, apply some Troforte fertilizer, a liquid feed during the warm months, and you should see uh, that tree start to carry more fruit. Dwarf trees can sometimes also take a couple of years longer than the more traditional trees to be able to get to a good size, to be able to carry more than a couple of fruit. So look on building it, look at building up soil first, get your soil in really good condition, and then your tree will pretty much take care of the rest. Joanne has messaged in about weird bugs that sound like frogs in the garden. So that sounds like the mole crickets. They drive her dog mad, which is unfortunate for the dog. And he's been digging to try and get them out. So the dog looks like he's trying to deal with the problem itself. He wants to know how to get rid of them. Well, the mole crickets are just part of the um, native fauna, the insects that we have in our gardens. If they're, they're really um, causing you problems, you can get some of the, the insecticides that will sp you can spray in your garden and kill off your mole crickets. The problem is with some of those products is they will take out some of the, the insects that are helping you in your garden as well. Um, I tend to, with mole crickets, I get a lot of them in my garden. I just tend to ignore them. I just pretend they are frogs so that the noise sounds even better. Maybe um, keep the dog inside at night when it's when the mole cricket's making heaps of noise or give it something to distract it, uh, that distracts it from the mole crickets. I'm really not a big fan of uh, bombing the, the garden with, with chemicals to kill off the mole crickets. But if you, you really need to do it, there are some, you can go and buy insecticides from your local garden centre that will knock the mole crickets off. Maybe look at rather than completely eliminating them, just get the numbers down a little bit, get the noise down a little bit, maybe turn the TV up a bit. You know, there's a few different things you can do there to alleviate that issue. 
Now, Lynn in Claremont has parts of a viburnum hedge struggling due to our hot summer. She's been giving it sea salt, been giving it some Troforte, and wonders if it's too late to really keep doing much else. Depending on the viburnum type, Lynn, uh, they will still continue growing well into the, the end of autumn, even um, still putting out fresh growth into winter. At this time of the year, what I'd be looking to do is, again, have you look in that soil because it's probably been dried out to an absolute parched state by our hot summer. Uh, get a good quality wetting agent in there, the sea salt soil wetter works very well, and then apply some really good quality compost to that soil. So almost mulching your soil with compost. Troforte is really going to help to get that soil microbes going, but getting the compost in and the soil wet is the, the two jobs I would do around that hedge first and foremost. It may not recover till spring. And um, so you, once the weather's nice and cool, which we're hopefully in Perth, not too far away, then you can give it a light prune, remove any of the burnt and damaged foliage, any of the stems that have died back a bit, tidy it right up, compost, wetting agent, and then wait till spring. As soon as we get some nice sunny weather in spring, Perth, that's normally the end of September, that viburnum will start kicking away and become um, nice and green and healthy again. If it's drying out over that summer, though, I would also look at your irrigation system before the start of this summer, just to make sure you're getting sufficient moisture into that root zone. Hedges can sometimes cause problems with the irrigation system because the foliage is so dense. If you're trying to push water through the foliage and into the root system, it can be a bit difficult. So a little bit of irrig um, a change of irrigation system might be on the cards as well, just to ensure you don't have the problem the following summer. Eileen Sharp in Donnybrook lives in Donnybrook and is struggling to get her orchids to flower at this, uh, um, in, so she lives in Southwest, getting her orchids, not really getting much in the way of flowering. So with your orchids, Eileen, it's about fertilising. So um, when the, the flower buds are coming out in early spring, it's time to start feeding them. Orchids do like liquid fertilisers, but you can also get some granulated control release fertilisers, which will feed those orchid bulbs slowly and regularly throughout the, goal, the growing season. And hopefully um, next season you'll see some beautiful um, orchid flowers. Be interested to know, Eileen, what varieties of orchids you're growing and um, have you had plenty of flowers from before or is this um, a new thing you're trying and, and just not having much success? That'd be great to have that little bit of extra information. Christina Burnett has spider-looking grasses that are spreading, uh, I'm assuming, in her lawn and wants a, a good killer to finally get rid of it. Well, if it's a weed that's growing in your grass, Christina, you need to identify the weed. That's really important. So getting a positive identification on the weed is the first step. So you might need to get your local lawn contractor to come in, have a look at that lawn, identify what the weed, the spidery grass is that's growing through your lawn is, and then they'll be able to recommend an appropriate selective herbicide, not only for that type of weed, but also for the type of lawn you have. It's different varieties of lawn. We grow quite a lot of different varieties all across Australia, different varieties of lawn will um, put up with different selective herbicides. And if you use the wrong selective herbicide for your variety of lawn, you'll actually damage your lawn as well as the weeds. So get somebody in a um, lawn contractor, just get them to come around, have a look at your lawn, recommend um, what spray to use. And generally speaking, I would get that lawn contractor to do the job for you. It's much easier than messing around with backpacks and sprays yourself. Kerry from Rollerstone, from my actual suburb that I live in, Perth, has camellias that are dropping its leaves, but she puts sea salt and mulch down. Is there anything else she can do to save it? Well, Kerry, if your camellia is dropping its leaves, it's a, a stress reaction. So the, the plant's reacting to some stress. And normally for at this time of the year, uh, given that we've had very little rain and a lot of warm days, I'd say that poor camellia is having a, a reaction to dry soil. So have a look at your soil first and foremost. If it is dry, get a good quality wetting agent on there. You get the wetting agent on, give it a good soak. When the rain comes, the um, wetting agent will help that water soak into the soil and actually move down into the root zone where the, the plant needs it. The good news is the Sasanko camellias are very hardy camellias. It doesn't take much to get them back looking healthy again. So put the, the wetting agent on, let the plant recover. When you start to see some signs of some new growth, Get some slow release fertilizer put that around the plant as well and a little bit of compost and it'll cover beautifully in spring sue borg has a yucca stump that's been chopped down and wants to know how to eliminate the yucca stump well, sue there's a couple of ways you can go with the yuccas so you can cut it again nice fresh cut and apply a product called tree and blackberry poison so it's a product from yates 
you mix it with a bit of Caro, let's paint it very carefully onto that stump and that will kill that stump off completely. And then the stump will start to break down, yucca stumps break down very quickly and it'll be easy to dig out. Or if you um, do have access to a couple of uh, strong bodies that are happy to swing on a shovel for a little period of time, yuccas aren't that difficult to dig out. They tend to have a large bulbous base, uh, it's almost uh, similar to a ponytail, not quite as pronounced. So they have that large bulbous base, but underneath them is a heap of fibrous roots. So if you have a shovel with a nice sharp edge, you can actually cut through those uh, fibrous roots reasonably easily and then get rid of the whole stump of the yucca that way you can just lift it out maybe cut it up into a few pieces to make it easier to handle and then off to the green waste tip to be turned into mulch which in my opinion is the best use for a yucca now lisa edwards in nambour on the sunshine coast has a lemonade tree that has crumply leaves so i don't know if that's uh crumply as in dried and crunchy or crumply as in distorted so uh, if it's just distortion, Lisa, if the, the leaves are all twisted and curled up, that would be citrus leaf miner, which we um, treat by applying pest oil, pest oil, white oil, either of those two products to try and kill off that little insect that gets into the leaves. They burrow around in the leaves of the citrus and they cause the distortions and the, and the, the curling and just tend to take a little bit of health away from the, the tree. If they're crumply as in crunchy, that means the tree's drying out. The root system doesn't have access quite enough moisture just to support all those, the foliage on the tree. And you'll have to make, have a look at your soil, see if you can get some more moisture in there, gain a wetting agent, a bit of compost if it's in the ground, improve the soil, make sure the moisture is soaking in and it's staying around that root run of the plant where it's easily access, accessible by the tree. And then it can support your foliage and your foliage will look a lot nicer. Um, Lee asked, do I have any recommendations for natural weed killers? There's a lot of natural weed killers on the, the market now. The, probably the best known one is a um, product called Slasher. So it's an organic product, so it's certified organic, so it's safe to use around, around all your plants, around your pets. Uh, you, as with other herbicides, you have to be careful not to get it onto non-target species. So if you've got weeds in your garden growing around other plants, make sure you only hit the weeds because the Slasher, if it goes on the leaves of the, the plants you're growing in your garden, will um, affect the leaves as well. Um, it will only knock down the soft leaves, the annual weeds. It won't kill off perennial grasses. And as far as I'm aware, there's no natural weed killers that will kill off your perennial weeds. So things like cooch that's invading your garden bed, um, kaikuya that's invading your garden bed, no, none of the natural weed killers will knock those off completely. They will burn them back to ground level, which can make them easier to, um, to get out. But slash is the one that most people know about and it's readily available. But there are a few others that have come on the market now and they're, they're getting uh, better and more effective. And um, so people, if you, if you don't like using the systemic herbicides, have a look out for those couple of ones. And we have a follow-up from Sue. She said, obviously wants to get rid of that yucca out of her garden bed and then wants to replace with uh, some native plants and wonders whether the poison, if she poisons that, that stump, will affect anything else in the area. Now, the um, tree and blackberry poison is will persist in the soil. So you, if you get it into the soil and leave that soil there, it will definitely still be there and will definitely affect anything you plant. It's um, a very strong herbicide. And you have to be extremely careful about how you use it. It will be taken up by the root system and other plants around. Um, ideally, you're only applying it to a, a stump and it's only soaking into the stump. You don't want to get any on the soil. Um, if you are looking to plant some natives in that area, Sue, so after you take the yucca out, my recommendation would be to bite the bullet and actually just dig it out. So cut it down, dig it out, get all the root mass out. Um, it's probably a good solid day's job for a couple of people but then you can plant back into that soil, plant your natives by adding some native concentrate to the soil, opening the soil back up, you know, go through, dig all the roots up so it's not compacted and not full of yucca roots. And then you can plant your, your native plants with, um, with great confidence. And if you do plant some natives in that garden, so send us in some pictures and um, show how much better your garden looks with native plants rather than yuccas. I look forward to seeing that. Mel Morrow has uh, rose leaves that are turning yellow and wants to feed them with chopped banana peels on the central coast. They are pinky roses. Pinkies are very nice little rose flowers that flowers a lot and doesn't get too big. Um, if your leaves are turning yellow, one, it could be just change of seasons, um, depending on how much rain you've had on the central coast. It could be that the, the soils had so much um, rainwater through it that a lot of the soluble nutrients have been washed away. 
Banana peels are a good um, source of potassium to put into your soil. I like to see your banana peels going into your, your home compost system rather than straight to the ground. And, and it's not a complete feed for the roses. Roses are big feeders. They like the full suite of nutrients, all the macronutrients, all the micronutrients. So if your leaves are turning yellow and it's not just in response to some weather conditions, a complete feed of a, a complete rose fertil fertilizer is definitely the way to go. Trophy is a good fertilizer, but there's plenty on the market that you can get and put around that rose and give it a feed. But keep in mind, we're coming into the cooler months. Your rose will be moving to a more semi-dormant state. They don't really go fully dormant in the warmer states and be ready for a winter prune come July. Then you can do some work on your soil, apply a fertilizer, and hopefully your foliage when it comes out in the spring will be really healthy. Follow up from Eileen about her orchids. There's Cymbidium, uh, Cymbidiums and Sydney rock orchids. That's fantastic. They're, the Sydney rock orchids are magnificent species of or orchids and Australian native. Um, it's had one flower on the on the rock or or orchid last year. So I think you just need to get into a, a good feeding regime with those orchids, Eileen, and hopefully you'll see a lot more flowers uh, in the coming seasons. And, and good luck with those. Um, I know a lot of people, when they start buying orchids, they get one or two. Next thing I know, they're full garden is full of orchids they're a bit of a, a collector's um favorite and they do tend to you get the bug on the um orchids there's so many different varieties and they are so so beautiful samson out in Swanview has a worm farm but the worms always die in the summer heat especially in our heat waves we had for those people who are not from wa we had three really bad heat waves where we had temperatures regularly in excess of about 41 42 degrees with no break in between so Samson wants to know how to control the temperature a bit more and keep them alive year round. Well, Samson, um, the worm farms, that is the, probably one of the biggest challenges in a, place, a climate like Perth, is keeping them alive during that warmer weather. I know a lot of people with their worm farms, what they do is get some soft drink bottles. So your, your litre, litre of quarter seat, soft drink bottles, plastic bottles, fill them up with water, freeze them, and then put them into the, the top of the worm farm as well to try and moderate the temperature, keep it cooler. Um, if you can get some hessian, you can buy that at your local hardware store, put that over the top of the worm farm, make sure it's well shaded and wet that um, hessian down a few times during the day to try and, again, just moderate that temperature. You're not going to be able to keep it cool when the outside ambient temperatures in the mid-40s, but you can keep it cooler and hopefully get your worm farms um, through those hot weathers. Worms, worm farms are a great thing to have in your suburban gardens because not only do you get that beautiful um, worm tea that you can make into a, a fertilizer and apply to all your, your garden you get the worm castings as well worm castings are can be used as a fertilizer themselves so you can dig that in around your plants citrus love worm castings or you can just use it as a general soil conditioner so um, if you've got room for a, a couple of little worm farms you're creating some veggie scraps in your kitchen it's a great way to use up the veggie scraps so they're not going into the the rubbish bin and going out to um to, to the tipping site put them in your worm farm Make yourself some fertilizer, make yourself some worm tea. So you've got liquid fertilizer, castings put in the garden. So good luck with that, Samson. Good luck to the worms. Leanne in Sutherland in New South Wales would love to grow a fruiting fig tree, but she doesn't have space in the garden and wants to know if she can grow that tree in a large pot. Leanne, you absolutely can grow figs in pots. A lot of people would prefer to grow them in large pots rather than in the ground because figs have a reputation for having very vigorous roots and the food fruiting fig is no exception not as bad as a, a morton bay fig but they still can uh, send the roots out a fair way so you need a large pot and um, i'd say at least 100 liters 150 liters would be ideal even larger if, if you if you want if you've got room for it and you want to spend that much money on a pot good quality potting mix is essential so a premium quality potting mix because it's such a large pot um, I would also recommend with that potty mix, adding, adding some coarse river sand to it, just to keep so to hold its structure in the long term. Because once you pot your fig into say 100 or 150 litre pot, you don't want to be taking it out of that pot you know, too soon, because it's going to be a big tree and it's going to um, be difficult to get in and out of the pot. So adding some coarse river sand to your potty mix will help that potty mix hold structure. Um, you'll be able to keep that tree in that pot for 10, 15 years without any dramas. You prune that tree very hard in winter, so you're pruning it back. It's almost going to, going to become like a bonsai fruit, fruiting tree. Um, even though you're pruning it hard, even though it's in a, a pot and not in the ground, you will still get plenty of fruit as a potted plant um, with the fig tree. They, they do very well in, in 
pots and they don't mind being a bit pot bound as well. So don't stress if the, the tree looks like it's filling the, filling the pot. Every couple of years, you might need to um, add a bit of compost to the top of the soil. You need to keep the plant well fertilised, but a bit of compost every couple of years will help keep the, the potting mix and the soil around the root system of that fig tree nice and healthy and keep that soil life growing so it can really support that fig tree. Uh, and figs, a little bit like the orchids, once you get one variety, you want to get two, three, four, next thing you know, you've got 57 fig trees growing in your backyard. But go for it, they're great in pots. Um, Adrian in Adelaide. Um, I've been to Adelaide for a while, has a self-seeded seedling camellia growing in their garden and wants to know, will it flower? Absolutely, Adrian. Camellias, all the varieties that grow, all the tens of thousands of varieties of camellias that are grown around the world, all started originally as a seedling. So uh, a lot of the camellia growers, whether they're in, in um, New South Wales or in California in the US or in Europe, um, they, they grow a lot of seedling plants every year. They grow them through to flowering and then select varieties that produce really nice flowers but also ones that have particularly good growth habits or really nice foliage so if you've got a cell site seeded camellia um, you may want to wait till the cool weather take it out of the ground put it into a pot and put it somewhere where it's um, well protected from any extreme weather and it's going to take maybe five six seven years before that seeded self-seeded camellia will flower um, even if it's not a, a sensational new variety, chances are it will be a very good garden variety of camellia and really well worth, if you've got the space and you don't mind waiting for five or seven years to see it flower, I would just keep it going and have a look because it can be a, a very pleasant surprise when some of these seedling camellias flower and they're just fantastic new variety. If you want to, you can get it registered and name it. Jeanette Marie Payne in Perth has chili thrip. Uh, and wants to know what works and what doesn't, has 70 roses that are very old. This has been a very depressing problem in Perth over probably the last three years. A lot of our rose growers, um, people who may have said, like Jeanette, have a lot of roses and really love them, had them for years, and they've been absolutely um, smashed by chili through it, destroys the foliage, really saps the vigour out of the plant. You don't get decent flowers. Um, very difficult to control. Um, Jeanette, what I recommend for my clients uh, with their roses is you have to have a, a, a consistent program of control to try and break the breeding cycle of the chili thrip. Well, uh, one of the issues that makes it difficult to control is they have a short breeding cycle. So it's, it's only about 10 days between populations. So um, a, a spray of an emitted copper based um, insecticide, so something like Comguard, and then follow that up with a different product. So Success Ultra is very good or neem oil, and you do um, alternate those every seven to ten days until you feel like you've broken that breeding cycle and the chili threat numbers are down. In winter, when you give those roses their hard winter prune, make sure you spray with the lime sulfur at the higher recommended rate that's on the on the back of the label. Re read the label of your spray and it'll have a recommended winter spray for, for your roses and that will also help control it because it'll, it'll kill off any uh, dormant chili threat but it also will help you with your fungal controls and other pest controls of your roses um, because you need to hit those roses need to be as strong as possible to be able to fight off the chili threat. Uh, in winter, it's a good time with those roses to really improve the soil around it. So some compost and well rotted animal manure, loosen the soil up a little bit, make sure the water's soaking in really well. You want to give those roses um, the vigour and the health. So if the chili thrip is still hanging around, it's not going to be as big an issue. The roses have the, the strength within them to, to fight off some of the worst effects of the, the chili thrip. Good luck with that, Jeanette. And um, we'd be really interested to know how you go dealing with the chili thrip. As I said, it's a, a problem we, we're still really coming to grips with in Perth. Uh, and hopefully it'll be something we can come up with a, a, a definitive solution because it's um, terrible to see some people have actually been taking their roses out and we hate to see that, particularly the older ones that have been in the garden for, for many, many years. Tony in the NT, it's good to hear from someone in the NT, has grass under the trampoline, obviously isn't getting a lot of sun and wants to know how to keep that grass alive. Well, the best way to keep that grass alive, Tony, is to move the trampoline trampoline around as regularly as possible. Share, share the, um, the pain around the lawn as much as you can. Um, if you leave that trampoline over that one area for too long, the grass that grows underneath it gets used to the shade. And then when you move the trampoline, that grass will get burnt off pretty quickly. That grass that's growing in the heavy shaded areas is a lot weaker than the grass that's out in the sun. It's not getting access to as much um, potential to photosynthesize to use that sunlight to make nutrients to support the grass. 
Um, you can, if you move it out from time to time, liquid feed the lawn. Um, so uh, apply a granular fertilizer in lighter amounts more regularly, and that will help as well. But the, ideally, you can, you'll be moving that trampoline as regularly as possible. And if you can do it sort of every weekend or at worst every second weekend, so not one area is just copping the, that heavy shade. And because eventually what you'll find will happen is that grass underneath the trampoline will eventually collapse and die off and you'll be looking at having to replace that at a, at a later date. So good luck with that. So move the trampoline, reg, regular light fertilizer. Laurie in Guildford has a gorgeous gum trees in their area. They're heritage listed, but they're coming an issue with large branches falling. Um, have, a, have you seen this? Yes, I have, Laurie. I've seen branches falling out of large gum trees regularly. Um, if it's on the verge, get in touch with your council. Ring your council, explain that the issues you're having. Well, document your um, interaction with your council well. So if you can, contact them by email. Do all your correspondence by email. Um, the councils will have a look. They'll come out. If, if you voice your concerns, they'll get an arborist out to have a look at the trees. Uh, it is a worry. Like These large gum trees are a very important part of canopy cover. They're important uh, habitat for, for birds, insects, lizards, a whole, whole lot. They'd be amazed at how many animals and insects are supported by some of these large gum trees. So the last thing we want to do is remove them, but they must be safe. So get in touch with the council, see if they'll get an arborist out to assess the tree. Um, there may be some things they can do too for the tree as far as um, some extra watering, some nutrient supply that makes the trees more healthy and they hold onto their branches a lot better. A lot of gum trees will shed branches in times of drought, so they'll sacrifice some branches so they can share the, the water around that's available to a smaller part of the tree and keep the tree alive. Um, so get your council out, get them to have a look. Hopefully they'll um, look after those trees for you, Laurie, and fingers crossed that you don't have any branches falling anywhere near you. Cheryl Horner has all her citrus fruit are fine, except for the lemons that have yellow leaves and the trees have all been fertilized. Cheryl, I wouldn't be overly worried about yellow leaves on the lemons. Lemons are very vigorous growing trees. They produce a lot of fruit. All that growth, all that fruit production uses a lot of nutrients. So sometimes that, neutral, that excessive nutrient use will result in some yellowing of the foliage. If it's just that one tree, it's been getting the same fertilizing regime as uh, all your other citrus. Do, do your standard, have a look at the soil, make sure that's not drying out. If it, the soil's in good condition, I would be looking at getting a liquid trace element mix and applying that with a backpack all over the foliage, like wet it really thoroughly with those liquid trace elements. Do it three to, uh, two or three times, maybe a month apart, and that should help green up that foliage. It might just be something as simple as a, an iron deficiency. So a liquid trace element will fix that up um, very quickly and get that tree looking fantastic. But Lemon trees do a lot of work. They need a lot of nutrients. So there's only 15 minutes to go. So get your last few questions in so I can answer them for you. Don't want to miss out. I'm only here for one more week after this. Uh, Lee Verrill in Brisbane. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that surname right there, Lee. Uh, has a Grevillea Superb. It's two years old, perfect growing conditions, but the trunk and branch, so the trunk and some of the branches are black. Is that normal? Not, no, not necessarily, Leah. That, your problem with that tree may be a bit of sooty mould. Um, you can get sooty mould on perfectly healthy plants. So uh, it normally comes hand in hand with a bit of scale. So the, the ants move, um, harvest the scale for honeydew, and one of the res results of that honeydew production is some sooty mould. So have a look at it. See if it'll just rub off with your thumb. Just push it over. It comes off. More than likely is sooty mould. Uh, you can get a, a fungicide and spray that on, onto the sooty mould and it'll clean up. If the trees look otherwise um, healthy, well, I wouldn't be too concerned, but if it is sooty mould, it's better to treat it than not because if it gets into a high, um, a high population of sooty mould, it'll get all over the foliage and smother the leaves out and then really weaken that grevillea. So have a look at that, look at controlling the sooty mould and also have a look and see if you've got a bit of an ant issue around those plants. So. Ants love the dry conditions, so it may be a case of a bit some wetting agent around that grevillea, get the soil holding on to a little bit more moisture and hopefully deterring the ants from uh, making a home in that grevillea. Judy Lacks in southern Queensland wants to know what she can do about hibiscus with yellowing leaves. Um, hibiscus do move into uh, having a few yellow leaves around this time of the year. It's not unusual, particularly if you're starting to get some cooler nights. Um, the nutrients in the soil with the cooler nights 
not as readily available as what they are during the warmer months. So if it's only a few of the leaves, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, do the, the check on the soil, make sure the soil's in good condition. Soil's healthy, the plant's otherwise healthy, it's just producing a few yellow leaves. Wouldn't be overly worried. You can, um, even at this late stage in autumn, can apply a, 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 some liquid fertiliser around the base of the tree just to make sure it's getting um, access to more readily available nutrients that you get in the liquid fertilisers and that tree will green up pretty quickly. Um, hibiscus love the hot weather. They love uh, our Australian summers. Wherever they're growing around Australia, they do their best work in summer. So as they come into autumn, they can tend to look at not not absolutely at their best, but if it's only a few yellow leaves, would not be worried about it too much. Francis in Rockingham has a big issue with aphids and wants to know what's the best way to get rid of them and stop them coming back. Well, aphids are one of those um, insects that you can have a huge amount of them on a plant and they're not really doing that much much damage. And there are a lot of natural predators that will come in and feast on the aphids. Um, if they're causing a problem and you're really concerned about them, even just getting the hose with a spray, spray nozzle on the ending hose and spraying them off so they all get washed off the plant. And you do that once a week, that will keep the aphids under control till the predators come in. If you really want to just knock them off, you can, any um, general purpose insecticide will, will take aphids out. They're pretty easy to control that way. But in my garden, I prefer just to hose them off. Um, I might do that two or three times. And by the time you get, you've done that two or three times, the natural predators of the aphids have made their way into your garden and they're taking care of it for you and saves the trouble of going out and buying insecticide. Karen in Southern River wants to encourage frogs into the garden. Well, good on you, Karen. That's a great thing to do. Uh, frogs are probably one of the, the animal species that really suffer from uh, urbanisation so that there's less and less habitat for frogs around. So what you need to do, Karen, is provide a habitat that's really great for the frogs and they will come end up in your garden for sure. So a pond, for frogs need some um, permanent water source. They need areas where they can uh, be protected from predators. So, you know, birds and, and unfortunately cats will, will definitely predate on cat um, frogs if they're around. So putting a pond, but putting lots of planting and dense planting around it that the frogs can hide under, some rocks that they can hide under, just produce, um, produce a really great environment and the frogs will move in and they'll feel, feel safe in your garden. Before you know it, you'll have heaps of them in there. Um, you can also look at uh, on your local uh, community pages for tadpole exchange. Um, there's, there's strict rules around moving tadpoles around uh, suburbs. They can't be moved too far from, from where they, they're found, but you can move tadpoles into your pond to sort of speed up the process and get those frogs into your, your garden uh, more quickly. But little pond, some uh, plantings around the pond that protect the frogs and, and make them safe from predators, and you'll have a, a healthy frog population before you know it. Mark Skelzy in Mudgee, uh, do I have a natural remedy for bronze orange bugs that seem to love my lemon tree? Uh, you can look at some of the low impact sprays. So, so neem oil can be effective against uh, bronze orange bugs. Uh, the best thing to do is if you can encourage birds into your garden, Mark, because birds will uh, predate on those, those orange bugs as well. Uh, that, that's probably the two two best options, encouraging birds in the garden and, and looking like neem oil or pest oil will, will, will try as a contact spray will help keep those um, orange bugs under control. They do quite a bit of damage to the um, to your lemon tree because they, they're a sap sucker and they love that fresh new growth and you'll see a bit of collapse in the, the new growth. So yeah, best to get them under control. Uh, follow up from Karen about the frogs. Do I recommend a cheap and easy pond setup? There, there's a few options you can go with. You can buy a preformed uh, fiberglass or, or sort of dense, high density plastic Ponds, they're not overly expensive. Um, or you can buy some pond liner. Pond liner is um, you know, reasonably cost effective where you just dig a hole. Make sure that the sand under the pond liner and even the preformed uh, pond liners as well is nice and clean, doesn't have rocks or tree roots in it, particularly rocks as they can pierce it. And she asked whether it needs shade. And shade's ideal. If you can get a, a spot in your garden where it gets um, a bit of morning sun and then some afternoon shade, that would be ideal for the frogs. Wendy Gavin wants to know if you can get rid of palm roots easily. Generally speaking, Wendy, no, you can't. Palm roots are um, pretty tough uh, characters to get out of your garden. Many of the, the palm roots and you know, the popular species that have been grown over the years are very ropey. Uh, they're hard to cut through with shovels. They're hard to cut through with even your second tiers. Um, it's just a question of persistence, uh, bite of small areas at a time, 
dig them out and um, you know hopefully uh, eventually get on top of them but there's no real easy way to get on uh, get them out unless it's a space where you um, cleaning the whole garden area out and you can bring a an, like a small excavator or even small skid steer loader in to, to, to pull that soil up uh, and the, a lot of the skid steer operators have an attachment for their machines called a, a rake bucket which can lift the soil up and basically sieve all those roots and rocks and other stuff out as well but if you're digging them out by hand there's no easy way other than just bite off um, manageable areas at a time and just keep persist at it persist at it, you'll eventually get on top Hannah in Sydney wants to know the best way to, to grow sunflowers. Um, will they grow back if I've cut them to have in a vase? Um, some of them will grow back and we'll put out side shoots and then you'll get some flowers. Probably not as spectacular as that main flower. They'll be um, side shoot flowers, tend not to be that big. Um, best way to plant them is in spring by seed. Uh, or if you miss the, the boat of getting in early in spring, they're quite often available at your local garden centre in Punnett. So they're a plant that's already got a bit of size, a bit of root system about them, and they'll take off really, really quickly. So get them in in spring, um, keep them well fed, nice, warm, sunny area, and you'll have sunflowers um, yeah, making your garden look fantastic. Uh, Mel's followed up about her pinky roses and wants to know, should she prune them? I would definitely prune those as a winter prune, as you do with the other species of rose. For people who are not familiar with the pinky, it's a more compact bush type rose rather than the uh, the traditional um, shape we see in the hybrid teas and the floribunda roses, it's far more compact than either of those two, but definitely still would uh, benefit from a prune. Normal thing, you're going through cutting out any damaged or diseased wood, anything that's a bit sort of thin and wispy looking and doesn't look like it's got any integral strength, cut that out and then you do a, a lime sulfur spray and feed them up, get them ready for spring growth. Bounce back very quickly, the pinky rose. And I'll flower for nine to 10 months of the year. Really good little variety of rose that I think should be growing a little bit more than what it is. Um, Sue Borg has asked that suggestions for a suitable liner for a raised timber garden plant. Wants to grow plants and veggies in it and a liner that's not going to leach any nasties into the food. Well, it depends a little bit, Sue, on uh, what your uh, the timber is. So if it's a hardwood timber, it's generally not treated with any uh, nasty products. If you want to seal it, you can seal the inside rather than um, getting a like a plastic liner. You can use the uh, food safe uh, waterproof lining that's um, quite popularly used in pond liners. So for painting uh, concrete ponds to seal those, it's a, a black bitumen type paint and some of them are rated as food safe. So you can use them in the, the ponds and it's perfectly safe for your fish in the ponds. You can um, then transfer that same type of uh, sealant onto the timber of your veggie beds and that will seal it up. But most of the pond liners that should be absolutely fine for that purpose, they're, they're not going to leach much into the, or anything into the soil. And um, just ask at your local uh, pond, pond shop, your pond and fish shop, uh, and they'll be able to tell you what those ponds, uh, pond liners are rated to. Because as I said, they, they've been used in ponds. They can't be leaching dangerous chemicals into the water because it will obviously affect the fish. Uh, final question for the day. So thank you all for your great questions. It's been a, a good morning. Plenty of questions kept me busy. Um, Chris, uh, Cherie Studley in Perth has a small lime tree and has a very large lemon tree in the same location, both fertilised and watered the same. So her lime tree is only producing very small limes, but it sounds like a lemon tree is doing fantastic and is uh, both being fertilised the same. Um, I wouldn't be overly concerned. Lime trees can take a few years more than lemon trees to get established and start having having a good solid uh, production of, of bit larger, you know, good quality fruit. Just to make sure your soil is in good condition with your, your citrus. They're big feeders, limes are big feeders as well. Uh, so compost and clay a couple of times a year in the sandy soils in the Perth sands. Uh, keep it well fertilised, liquid feed during the warm months. And that lime tree should, once it gets to a certain size, it gets a critical mass of root system. And all of a sudden that lime tree is producing huge amounts of crops of good quality limes. So a, a healthy lemon and lime tree in, sounds like a, a good combination in any suburban garden. So competition draw, as we said at the start of the show, we're giving out a $50 gift voucher from Garden Express. And our winner, we really had no one else to go for other than Sue Ball with her yucca and timber question. 
timber garden questions, Sue. Thanks for your questions. And remember, Sue, once you've planted that garden up, you've got the yucca out and planted up with natives, send us a, a picture of that. We'd love to see how your veggie garden's going as well. So make sure you um, send us those pictures in as soon as they're ready and they're looking absolutely fantastic. So congratulations. To claim your prize, please message us on Facebook uh, with your email address. So to wrap up, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure, let us know that you enjoyed what we, we've done today. Um, so thankful to all the questions. If we didn't get to you, we'll definitely get to you next week. Um, get your questions in early for next week's live show. That way you'll be at the top of the queue. And remember, you can always jump onto our website, catch up with our previous stories from The Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or on our YouTube channel, thegardengurus.tv. And, of course, tune in tomorrow for Episode 8 of The Garden Gurus. Happy gardening, everyone, and I'll talk to you again next week.